So this is the OnePlus 11, and I've been using it on and off for the last couple of months now, pretty much as it came out here in the US around mid-February. The phone starts at a price of $699, goes up to a price of $79 for the second tier model. And I'll be honest, this is probably the first phone I've reviewed in my whole existence of this channel that's priced pretty much exactly where I think it should be priced. For this price, I think you're getting exactly what you're paying for. So let's go ahead and talk about it. As far as build and design, I mean, the phone itself looks pretty, I would say gorgeous in my opinion. I think pretty much every device is gorgeous, if I'm being honest with you. It does have Corning Grill Glass 5 on the back, with this on the front, and then you have an aluminum frame. On the back, you do have curved sides and edges, so it's like a very curved, very well-rounded device feeling, so it's very, very comfortable in the hand. I just don't really like the texture that they use for the matte black glass, at least for this Titan Black colorway. If you get the green, you will get a glossy finish, um, but with the Titan Black, it is matte, but like I said, it's got like a weird texture to it. I'm not a huge fan of it. The frame itself is relatively thin on the sides and then it flattens out on the top and at the bottom. So you can't kind of prop it up if you wanted to on a desk. It's good for B-roll. But besides that, um, that's good to know. But it is glossy, like I said, so it does pick up a decent amount of fingerprints. And overall, the phone itself is kind of slippery. It's not the most uh, grippiest phone out there. So I would recommend getting a case just because, like I said, it's a little slippery. And also to get rid of that weird texture from the back. And also, it's a lightweight phone. It's not actually that heavy. I'm not sure what the grams are to be exact, but compared to all other devices that I've used out there, it's definitely one of the lightest, if not the lightest flagship phone I've used in a long, long time. Um, but getting a case will add a little bit of weight to it as well. If you're a sucker for having a slightly heavier phone, if you're used to a heavier phone or something like that, uh, you'll definitely want to get a case to add, again, some grippiness and also a little bit of weight and thickness. Um, another thing to mention with the building design here is going to be this camera bump. It kind of helps a little bit with holding it in your hand. It is pretty thick, so it does help here with uh, putting your hand behind it and be able to hold it with one hand. Um, and on top of that, if you put it on a flat surface like a table, it is going to rock a good amount. But if you, again, if you get a case, it might help uh, with uh, it not rocking as much. And the case I personally use is the OnePlus Sandstone case. I got it free when I pre-ordered it or when I purchased the phone. So that's the only reason I use it because it's a free case. Um, but it is pretty nice. It's not super thick, um, but it does add a little bit of grippiness, which I like. It's also got an IP64 water and dust resistant rating. I'm not entirely sure how resistant that makes it. I just know it can survive or withstand some splashes of water. I personally have been splashing it in the shower and just spraying it with B-roll. So it's been just fine. I think I'm maybe taking it a little bit too far, but it's still surviving just fine. I also have read somewhere, I forget where it, I might've been read it honestly, that sometimes OnePlus is not like paying for those higher ratings. So they'll smack or throw in a lower rating, but really they protect their phones for a higher rating. I don't know, I guess there's, some, there's probably someone out there on YouTube who's been testing that, but uh, just, I guess, keep that in mind, but also take it with a grain of salt. Now, as far as buttons and ports, you do have your power button and your volume locker on opposite sides, and they're relatively clicky buttons. They're pretty thin, though, so I kind of wish they were a little bit thicker or maybe even just a little bit bigger in general. Um, but besides that, they're pretty clickable and pretty comfortable to get to. They're pretty ergonomically placed, in my opinion. You also have an alert slider, which um, basically allows you to mute your phone, set it to ring or vibrate uh, really quickly without having to actually go into the settings. I think actually might be the only way you can adjust the uh, volume, but um, it's still pretty convenient uh, and really simple to just switch that slider whenever you need it. Then you have USB-C at the bottom and then you have your dual SIM card slot. It is two physical SIM card slots that can go into that, which is pretty nice. So if you travel or wanna have two phones on a single, or two lines on a single phone, then you can do that here. You also have the ability to add eSIM. And as far as like those connections and stuff like that, I haven't had any kind of issue. Now I do work from home, so I'm mostly on Wi-Fi and a few times I have gone out with 5G. I've had little to no issue. I receive all calls that come in, uh, text messages, no issues with that. So for me, service has been just fine. And then you have your dual firing speakers, which sound pretty good for me, at least. I'm not a huge audiophile. I just use it to listen to music every now and then, watch videos, uh, watch short form content, and everything sounds just fine to me. It's got a decent, well-rounded bass, in my opinion. I'm not sure what mid-tones and high-tones are. I, I would assume what they are, but I'm not entirely sure. But to me, it just sounds well-rounded. So I think speakers are pretty good. If you're comparing it to other devices, then you might notice a difference. But to me, it sounds pretty good for everything I do. And the phone also has really, really good haptics. You have the option of customizing it a little bit so you can choose from crisp and gentle, 
crisp is a little bit more aggressive and like you feel it there and gentle it's like a little bit softer and subtle so you don't feel it as aggressive and i personally prefer gentle sometimes i'm feeling a little bit crisp um, but you can also switch up the intensity uh, if you wanted to but whichever one you pick it just feels really nice i think the haptic motors on this device is amazing and if you try out their little demo that they have so you can try out how it feels it's, it's so nice it's it's really nice with the haptics that they have here now as far as the display it is a 6.7 inch 120 hertz 1440p ltpo 3 dynamic fluid something display with uh, i think uh 1300 uh, peaks of knitage or knitage of peakage, whatever the hell that means. Um, basically, I think you're getting a flagship display here. It may not be the brightest on paper on the market, but it's still overall a fantastic display. From just scrolling around, it's super smooth. The OS is, for the most part, very smooth. Scrolling through apps, whatever you're doing, smooth. Everything looks sharp. Everything looks vibrant and colorful. It just looks really good overall. I don't think we're gonna have any kind of issues with this display. You do have the option of going into the settings and turning on all kinds of different features, such as being able to turn on either changing your color to vivid, natural, or cinematic and brilliant, which are pro modes, um, to change the color. You can also turn on something called a natural tone display, which is I think kind of like, um, what's, what's the one from iPhone? I forget what it's called now. I think it's True Tone. Yeah, I think it might be True Tone. Um, basically, it changes the ambient lighting of your display Display, or it changes the color temperature, I should say, based on the ambient lighting in your environment. You also have eye comfort shield, which is kind of a similar thing where it'll uh, really reduce the amount of blue light being displayed on the display to you know help reduce some strain on your eye when it's almost like time for bedtime or something like that. You can set it for a schedule and whatnot. Um, and then you also have something called an image sharpener, which will help. I think it's AI that basically tries to clear up some quality and images and videos to look a little bit more sharper and then something with video color boost it just boosts the colors even if i think the video is not hdr it'll boost the colors and then something that's really cool that i haven't seen in any other device is an auto select feature for the resolution since you can go up to 1440p or stay down to 1080p you can also choose the option to auto select so the phone i think will just decide based on what you're doing on your phone if it should go up to 1440p or stay down to 1080p which i think is pretty genius it might help out a little bit with battery life I personally just leave it on 1440p. I paid big bucks for it. Might as well leave it on its highest settings. And something to consider too is that the display is a curved display. So on the edges or sides, whatever it does, you know, have this waterfall curvedness to it. I personally don't mind it just because if you use a case, it does avoid any external touches with the palm or your thick hand, or whatever. Um, but uh, it does build up a little bit of dust and particles between the edge and the case. But regardless, I'm okay with the edge display. If you're not a fan of it, then you're gonna wanna stray away from this one. Um, and it also has pretty minimum bezels, in my opinion. Like on the top and the bottom, the chin and whatnot, I think it looks a little bit thick. But um, besides that, I, I think it's you're getting a pretty box to box experience. The curves in the corners do have this little rounded finish to it. So there's some applications that may not uh, account for a display that has those kind of curved corners just because it may think it's a box to box display and it may end up cutting out some kind of buttons or some kind of UI elements within that app, which can be kind of annoying if you know you, you don't realize that. And also not to mention, like I mentioned earlier, the phone does have a slightly slimmer width. Um, so there's some times where you're watching a video if you're not zooming in or pinching into zoom or even with doing that you may lose a little bit of more content so if you're not pinching the zoom and you have black bars on the sides the black bars are just slightly bigger compared to other devices with the same size display size so that's one thing to consider that it may not be the best display for 16 by 9 videos but for other type of videos that are more of a wider aspect ratio, it may be perfect for it. Um, and for like vertical apps, uh, portrait apps, it doesn't seem to cut off anything from the sides. Just one small thing to keep in mind with that. And then also you have a small little cutout for the camera in the top left corner. The only complaint you could say is uh, if you could wish it was in the middle, it personally doesn't bother me, but it would be nice if it was down in the middle. And because it is a curved display, I choose not to install a glass scripter on the phone itself. It does come with a plastic one already pre-installed. So I'm just keeping that one on until it comes off naturally on its own. As far as biometrics and lock screen security, you do have the option of a pin or a character, password, or a pattern if you wanted to. For biometrics, you do have your 2D facial recognition and then an under display optical fingerprint sensor. For the 2D facial recognition, it works 
pretty much nine out of 10 times I have like little to no issue with it. Sometimes if you're in a very, very dark environment or at a weird angle, sometimes the phone won't recognize you. Uh, but most of the time I have little to no issues with it and it seems to be really, really fast as soon as it recognizes you or as soon as you turn the phone on, it usually recognizes you right away. Um, and you do have the option of staying on the lock screen or jumping right into the home screen as soon as it recognizes your face. And if you stay on the lock screen, it does have the ability to lock the details of your notifications. And then once it recognizes your face, it'll be able to unlock those notifications and show you the details, which is pretty neat in my opinion. Now, as far as the under display fingerprint sensor, it also works pretty much nine out of 10 times. You do have to hold it down for at least a second. If you're too fast, sometimes it won't recognize you. So overall for me, I personally have little to no issue. It works fast, it does the job, and having both facial recognition and the under display fingerprint sensor, if one fails, the other one will back it up and you'll be able to use it. So biometrics for me are just fine. And not to mention, you can change the animation of that fingerprint sensor in the settings, which is pretty neat. There's a few options, you can't really choose a custom one, but you choose from a set of presets, which is pretty cool. As far as performance, the OnePlus 11 does have the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 with either eight or 16 gigabytes of LPDDR5X RAM. And then for storage, you either have the UFS 3.1 for 128 gigabytes of storage, or if you upgrade, you do have 256 gigabytes of storage with UFS 4.0. So I honestly think you might not notice a huge difference, but this is the slightly faster uh, storage and RAM on both of them. Um, but honestly, for performance, it's a fantastic device. The chipset is not only efficient, but it is speedy, it's fast, it's reliable. It's pretty much what you expect to get from a flagship in 2023. So I have little issues to complain about with the performance. I think the most of my complaints are gonna be from the software specific, but as far as performance, the phone runs really well. So everyday stuff such as just social media, uh, browsing the internet, using the camera, playing games if you're a big gamer, you're gonna enjoy it on the OnePlus 11. You'll have little to no problems using it. Even if you're, I think you're in a hot environment, the chipset itself doesn't seem to get hot at all. The most I felt it getting warm was once playing games and it just felt slightly warm. It wasn't like the phone was getting hot. I've experienced phones where everything from the whole back of the phone feels hot, the frame feels hot, this phone, just feels warm at most. Like I said, if you're in a hot environment, I'm sure if you're pushing this really, really hard, maybe you'll get it to get hot. But besides that, I think the phone has been performing really well, in my opinion. As far as software, it is Android, currently Android 13 with Oxygen OS 13. And Oxygen OS 13 overall, or just Oxygen OS in general, it's not my personal favorite. It's also not my least favorite, but it provides you with a good amount of customizations but there's some small things that I just find weird and odd that it chooses to do. So let's walk through every piece of the software just so you can get an idea of what it's like using it and you can get an idea of the settings and stuff like that. So let's go over it. So first the lock screen, it's pretty basic. You get your single clock style, you get your notifications, which by the way, I am not a huge fan of the way notifications come up on your OnePlus 11, just because it'll show you the top three notifications and then it expects you to swipe down to see your app or notification drawer and see the rest of your notifications. There's no indications like it are little icons you know, at the bottom or at the top to let you know that you have more notifications stored in the notification drawer. I just find that annoying because you might miss a notification. Then with your shortcuts, you have the option of choosing between your Google devices, your Google Assistant or your Google Pay. And then on the right one, it's gonna be the camera at all times. So you don't have an option to choose which kind of shortcuts you wanna use. And then for the always on display, again, a handful of different layouts and options that you can choose from, but not to the point that you can customize every single little thing. You do have a couple options, but there's not too much customization in my opinion, but at least it'll give you a ton of different options to choose from from a default layout. And then jumping into the home screen, it's Android, so it gives you the ability to move apps anywhere freely, just like I like. Uh, but other stuff that you can do is that you can use these folders that allow you to enlarge the folder, which then allows you to actually physically be able to still get into those apps without having to open the folder again. So you can add a ton of apps without taking up too much space, which I really, really like. And then on top of that, you do have the ability to change up the transitions when you're switching between pages if you wanted to. You can switch up your icons, either you know choosing from the little the small default options there that you have to choose from, or you can also turn on color, uh, what's it called, uh, material U, 
uh, which is stock on Android, which basically allows you to choose the colors from your wallpaper. And actually, you now have the ability to choose presets. Beforehand, you could only choose your specific colors, which I personally prefer, I kind of like that. But now they give you some presets as well, which is kind of similar to what the Pixel Experience does and also with Samsung and stuff like that. And on the Google Discover page, I really like that they add the quick search for Google at the very top there. Basically allows me to not have to have a separate widget on my home screen for Google search. I can just rely on the Google Discover page. I don't really use the Google Discover page to actually look for articles and stuff like that, but it's there if I want to use that, but the search bar is really convenient. And then take a look at the app drawer. It's basically the app drawer. It contains all your apps. There's not really much you can do there besides being able to multi-select, either create into a folder to put on your home screen or uninstall. And then you can also change up the order to, I think, either the most recently installed or the most used. Next, looking at the notification drawer, it's pretty much like every other Android OS. Get your notifications, messages at the top, normal notifications in the middle, and then you get your sound notifications at the bottom. It groups notifications from the same app. If it's from the same kind of event or type of notification, it'll get grouped together, or if it's a thread or something like that. Um, when you interact with some of the notifications though, it is a bit different and a bit odd. So for the one thing that's odd for me is when you swipe to the left. So when you swipe to the right, it clears the notification. But when you swipe to the left, it brings up this little mini menu, which just allows you to either hit the trash can to clear it or open up the settings or like a little another mini menu for that specific app. And it'll allow you to switch that app to a silent notification. It's the exact same menu as if you were to hold down on a notification. I just don't understand why it makes you do that or has you do that. Like just swipe to the left or make it like iOS where if you're swiping to the left and you stop, it opens up the menu. But if you keep on swiping, just clear it, <laughs> please just make it simple. Um, but then the other thing is when you're interacting with a group of notifications, when you click on the group, it'll open up the group of notifications and then you click on the specific notification that it'll take you into for that app. It's kind of up to you to decide if you like that or not. I personally don't mind it just because sometimes I just want to pick the specific one and I want to click every single individual one so that I you know, can see every, every individual thread. Cause then if I click on the whole thing, then it just takes me straight to my app and it might not show me those notifications and the notifications for that app. So that's your own personal preference. And looking at the quick settings, you do have the ability to access your first seven quick toggles, uh, depending on the order you have them when you first swipe down for your notifications. And then you also get access to your brightness slider. But notice how when you first swipe down, there's five quick toggles in a row. And then when you swipe down again, they, you have access to the rest of, the, of your quick toggles, but there's only four in a row. I kind of wish that they would allow us to switch it to five. It wasn't an option that I could see, but I wish they would do that. But for the most part, it works like it's supposed to. You got your quick toggles to quick settings. You can toggle stuff on and off or go into the settings with it. It is a bit confusing though, because there's some tiles that, or some quick toggles that when you click on one of those quick toggles, it opens up a little mini menu or nah, like a little pop-up that you can you know do some stuff for that setting. So the one that I don't like the most is the Bluetooth one. For some reason, I have issues with it. When I go to go into it, to go connect to a specific Bluetooth device, so in my case, I'm connected to a speaker. For some reason, when I click on it the first time, it does like this weird animation where it looks like I'm trying to click or hover over other different devices so when I'm not really trying to, so I end up trying to click again and cause it to disconnect or try to connect to a different device. It's a, it's a mess. It's, it's confusing, it's weird. I'm not sure why it's doing that but I don't like the fact that it does the pop-up. So for music as well, when you click on that music player, it takes you to this little pop-up and you have to click on the music player again to go into the actual app. And speaking of the music player, notice how the quick toggles aren't all the way down. It's not the most one-handed friendly for these quick toggles because there's so much space wasted at the bottom. Wish it was the other way around. The space, empty space was at the top and the quick toggles were at the bottom. Makes it more one-handed friendly. But even when you're playing media, it still doesn't bring all the toggles down. It still plays in the top right corner and the toggles aren't all the way down, which I find annoying. Um, and the other thing is gonna be that the media output, why is it hidden behind a little mini meatball menu? I, that'd be super useful for it to be out as one of the quick toggles so that I can quickly change the media output from my device. But on the positive note with the quick settings, you do have the ability to change the shapes. You can change the shape that it shows for each quick toggle. So Bravo, OnePlus, I'll you know, let you off the hook for the other stuff that I'm annoyed with because you can let me change the shape. And you can also let me change 
some of the status bar stuff so you can take off whether it shows Bluetooth or LTE or whatever or Wi-Fi. You can toggle off those different icons if you wanted to and change the style of the battery status. So props to OnePlus for that. I forgive you for everything that's gone wrong for the quick settings, but moving on. And then touching on multitasking, that's something that I do on my phones all the time. The Auction OS does allow you to do split screen mode or uh, window mode or either picture in picture with like YouTube or some of that or other streaming apps or whatever. Picture in picture works just fine. Window mode, I never use. It can only do, I think, one window at a time, which is only really useful if you're trying to use it like for like a calculator or something like that. I don't see why you would want to use another app in window mode, but it's there if you want to use it. Split screen mode, pretty useful. I personally use it to either look at two shopping apps or sometimes I'll be watching a YouTube video at the top and then scrolling an app at the bottom. It's similar to picture in picture, but this way, the picture in picture window doesn't cover up the app. But while multitasking works for the most part and can be handled on this device, the one thing that I don't really necessarily love is the way you actually commence and start multitasking. The main way I do it is using the smart edge bar or smart bar something like that it's a sidebar i think it's called uh basically it's a little sidebar that you can swipe over and it can open up this little mini dock that has a couple of apps and also access to your app drawer and what i do is, is i just grab an app drag and drop and you can start split screen mode that way i'm okay with that uh, i just wish you could add a couple pre-saves or presets of your most commonly used uh, multitasking uh, pair so if, for example like i said youtube and usually it's reddit or something like that i wish i could save that so i can just quickly tap on that preset and it just takes me right into that multitasking mode but another thing with that smart edge bar or sidebar is that when you click on one of the apps so you don't drag and drop and just tap one of the apps instead of it opening in full screen mode it opens it up in the window mode not sure why it, it is a, there is a toggle at the top of the window to go into full screen mode and it's pretty quick for the animation but um, it's just two extra steps or just an extra step that it's not necessary i'm a small complaint but that's why i'm here i'm here to complain moving on from that though you do have a couple of different modes there's i think a kids mode which i've never used but it's there you have focus mode which is basically used to you know, you know avoid distractions and stuff like that uh and then you also have your bedtime mode which you can't change too many settings and all these modes you, there's not a ton you can change I think uh, when UI, from what I experienced, allows you to change a lot more, which is pretty cool. Like wallpapers and stuff like that. iOS does that as well. Um, but anyways, it, there's not uh, too much you can change, but still, it's pretty useful to be able to block out notifications and stuff like that when you're in a specific mode. And then you also have a couple of uh, different privacy options and features. So for one, you have something called a private safe. Basically allows you to store away some images, some files, some documents, some audio files. So if there's like stuff for work, that you use that you don't want other people to use, then you can just hide it in that private safe. You also have the ability to hide apps. So you put them into this secret folder essentially, and then you just go into your dialer, put in your private code, and then it unlocks this little dock or folder of your private apps. Then you also have the ability to use your biometrics to block apps. So if you wanna keep your app visible, but you don't want people to access it, and it usually doesn't require a biometric, just use this feature. It will require a biometric to even access it or open it. So anytime you open it, it'll ask for that biometric, which is pretty cool. You also have the ability to clone your system. So basically you have like two separate phones in one phone. So if you wanna have like a, um, I don't know, a business side, wink wink again um a business side and then your personal side you can do that if you wanted to and then the ecosystem oneplus in my opinion relies mostly on the google slash android ecosystem as far as like software so for rcs and for find mine which is just google's find mine and then you have there's one other thing google meet i think and then there's something else but um basically it works with pretty much every other google and android ecosystem stuff which is pretty neat or pretty expected I should say. It does have some hardware ecosystem with the buds and then you also have, I think they've only ever made one watch. Um, then they have the newly released OnePlus pad and that's pretty much it I think. Um, besides that you can connect to other devices such as Samsung devices. I personally use my Samsung watch and I've also been using it with my Samsung tablet. Not that I really can do much with it but it can connect with the messages and stuff like that. Um, so for ecosystem it's, it's there it's open it's google reliant but it's not the best out there it's definitely one of the weakest ones um available out there 
And then lastly, looking at the support for the software, it is gonna be supported for five years of uh, security updates and then four years of major OS updates, which for this price, for $6.99 up to $7.99, and sometimes at a discount, you can keep this phone for five years. <sighs> Man, you're getting a bargain if you ask me with that. But um, as far as consistency though, I, I think it's been getting an update at least once a month. So. So far, it has been getting consistent updates, which is good to see. As far as the cameras, I'm not a heavy camera user, and I personally find these cameras to be pretty good, but not the best out there, but also not really the worst. But um, let's, let's talk about them real quick. So with the front camera, you do have a 16 megapixel camera, and for the most part, I'd say it takes pretty decent selfies. It's again, not perfect, but it's also pretty good. On cloudy days, it does really seem to throw that white balance into the warmer side versus on sunny days, it does tend to overexpose a little bit in my opinion. If you have these white or bright areas, it will just really brighten it up and it just looks too bright. Um, overall though, it does have a good amount of detail and the color, like I said, the white balance is a bit on the warmer side, so it's not the most accurate to at least my skin color, but it's okay. Uh, it's overall, like I said, a good selfie shooter. If you don't mind tweaking maybe some things beforehand or tweaking it a little bit afterwards, but by default, it's not my favorite, but again, it does the job. It also doesn't have focus in the front, so I can focus on something that's in front of you, like a little, I don't know, leaf or something. In low light situations, it can look a bit washed out in my opinion. It doesn't seem to bring in enough light with the sensor, I think. It's not big enough to be able to bring in enough light, um, especially when you're not using the fill light. Like It's still bright enough that it doesn't allow the fill light to actually fill light on your face, um, so it doesn't look that great. But once it gets darker and you can use that fill light and it does come into effect, it actually looks pretty decent. It does, again, look a little washed out just because it's brightened up your face, um, but it's still able to bring in a decent amount of detail instead of it being pitch black. For video on the front, it does cap out at 1080p, which is pretty disappointing in my opinion for this price and for a flagship phone. Um, but in dark and low situations, there's just a lot of noise. It just has, I mean, it's expected. If it's low light, it, it's gonna have some noise. If you do have a little bit of fill light, it's able to you know, lighten up your face a little bit. And for 1080p, it actually doesn't look too bad. Even though it is a bit noisy, I expect it to be noisy. But for 1080p, I think it looks actually pretty decent in low light. Um, but in normal situations, it again does have a tendency, in my opinion, to overexpose those bright areas. So whether it be the sun or whether it be something on my, I'm wearing like a bright sweatshirt or, or something, it, it's just going to look overexposed. I'm not sure why it's doing that, uh, but it just looks blown out. Detail is mid because of the 1080p quality. It's not the sharpest looking, so it doesn't look that pretty. Um, and again, the color, the white balance tends to be on the warmer side. Uh, so it's the color is not the most accurate, but it's also not too crazy out there. Um, but overall, the front video, I think, is one of the weakest sides of uh, the OnePlus 11 when it comes to the cameras. As far as the back, you do have a 48 megapixel ultra wide, a 50 megapixel wide, and a 30, 32 megapixel telephoto. Overall, I will say that the back cameras are very good. I think you get a pretty solid camera system here. Uh, I find the quality to be overall sharp and clear and just looks very vibrant in my opinion. The biggest critique though is gonna be that the colors do shift quite a bit from going from the ultra wide, wide, and then the telephoto. Uh, I'm no expert, but I definitely can see a shift here, whether it be the white balance or something or the color temperature, the vibrancy, the saturation, or even the exposure is just, Something is off when you switch between each of them. You can definitely notice a bit of a difference. The main wide seems to be the best looking of the three. It just has overall good vibrancy, a good HDR looks like the, the dark areas and the bright areas seem to balance themselves out when you're on one shot. Now the ultra wide isn't too far off compared to the wide. I think it has the least amount of difference when switching between them. It just looks a little bit darker in the shadows and is not as brightened up for the photo. But overall it's still pleasing and vibrant for the most part. Uh, not to mention it does have autofocus on that ultra wide so you can click close to a subject and get like a macro leg shot. The telephoto on the other hand, I find it to be the most jarring or more st most different when switching between the wide to the telephoto. It, it, I don't know what exactly is changing, whether it be, like I said, the, the white balance or um, the vibrancy, it just doesn't look exactly the same as the white. It just loses a little bit of that punch, that color, that 
it just throws off the colors for me. I'm not sure what exactly it is. Um, but the zoom capabilities, it is an optical 2x zoom, and then it can go up to a max digital of 20x zoom. I personally wouldn't go further than 10x max. Uh, it just looks a little bit noisy, especially once you start to get to a low light. It just does not look that great. It suffers because it doesn't bring in enough light in telephoto at digital zoom. It just, yeah, just, just doesn't look bad. I wouldn't stay to 2x zoom max and low light. Um, but overall, it's pretty solid in low light situations, I would say. It does seem to bring in a decent amount of light and still get a little bit of um, of image out of a pretty low light or even dark situations. It's still able to get a little bit of something out of nothing. Um, the main lens though does the best job out of the ultra wide telephoto and the wide in general. Stick to the wide if you want to do low light shots just because it's able to bring in the most light. I also noticed though that inside shots that were in pitch black situations, there were these red dots that started showing up. I'm not sure where they were coming from or what was producing them, but they were showing up and it was kind of weird. Now, as far as video, you can shoot up to 8K on the main wide lens, but it is kept out at 24 frames per second. I personally prefer to shoot 60, or not 60, 30 frames per second, but you can shoot 60 frames per second if you wanted to. Um, but either way, 8K, it's there. I don't use it. The quality does look sharp. It does look pretty decent. Um, not the best stabilized, um, but it's, it's there if you want to get the sharpest quality video out there. So personally, I shoot my video at 4K 30. And the biggest downfall here for this, just 4K in general, it's gonna be the fact that the ultra wide and the wide shoot 4K, but then the telephoto does not. So anytime that you try to zoom in digitally, it's gonna be all reliant on that wide lens. So it's just gonna be cropping in and eventually you get to the point that it just looks bad. But besides that, before we get to how bad it looks, the rest of the video, ultra wide, wide, I think overall looks pretty decent. I think it looks sharp. It looks pretty good quality. Again, the uh, HDR and the exposure is overall pretty good in my opinion. Um, so I, I'm not sure. I just I just think it's a very good, solid video. It's probably a little bit more unrealistic compared to what I'm actually seeing. Not the most natural looking as far as colors, but I think it looks pretty decent. It's nice and pleasing to the eye. Again, if it's your preference, um, and for me, it's it's fine. But again, the, that, the bad thing is going to be that you can't zoom in that, not wouldn't say far, but with good quality. With the digital zoom, with that main wide, it suffers. It, it really does suffer. You can use a telephoto if you wanted to with 1080p, but I personally don't shoot 1080p, so I'm not even going to bother. I also tried out the stabilization modes, which capped out at 1080p with 60 frames per second. And personally, I think the normal video is already pretty well stabilized, so I really don't really use the stabilization modes, but for the most part, it does make the video look a little bit more stabilized if you wanted to get that kind of video shot. Now, as far as low light situations, the ultra wide does struggle a little bit if you're not in a area that has a little bit of light available. But once you switch to the wide lens, it's gonna be the better one to shoot low light video in. Again, if you're in a pitch black situation, just don't expect anything. Don't expect a miracle. Um, yes, you can see maybe a little bit of movement or pretty much a lot of noise, but what do you expect? There's no light. You, you, you gotta expect it to be a little bit of a compromise here. But for the most part, I think if you have a little bit of light, it does look pretty decent. And then looking at social media, so for me, Snapchat, overall, the back camera photos look pretty similar to the actual photos taken on the back camera. Same with the front. The front may not be the prettiest, so sometimes it does overexpose, so it will overexpose on the Snapchat as well. Um, but for the most part, it does look pretty decent. Now you can't use your ultra wide or telephoto lenses, so I would just stick with the wide lenses for Snapchat. And then for video, it's the worst compared to the video or photos, I should say, especially because it just does a lot of compression, so it doesn't look good, especially when you're using the front cameras. Whew. It already is not the best in general for video and taking video with Snapchat looks even worse. So take that with how you will. And in case you're curious, you do have a bunch of other options for video here. So you can do like a uh, slow-mo time-lapse uh, or whatever kind of things you want to do. You have those options available. And one thing I don't like with the camera experience is the zooming in experience. For some reason, the UI they decide to use, it's kind of weird. It doesn't have these presets. You have to go up and down with this little toggle button thing system. It, it just, it's just weird. I'm not a huge fan of it. So overall of cameras, video side is probably the weakest side, especially on the front camera, but photos overall generally, I think are pretty good. So if you're someone who really wants the best camera system out there, then this probably won't be the best camera for you. But for someone who just wants to take a photo of the moment or of something to remember the next day, this will be just fine for you. For me, 
I think I would be just fine for this. Besides the uh, Snapchat stuff, that's the only thing I don't like, but besides that, I'm okay with the camera system. As far as battery life, the OnePlus 11 has a 5,000 million power battery, and this battery is amazing. That Snapdragon HN2 is really doing the works on this device. So on average, I get maybe anywhere from 16 to about 30 or so, maybe a little bit more some days of total usage. With screen on time, it again varies depending on what I'm doing and what kind of apps I'm using, but usually it's anywhere from four at the minimum to about seven or eight sometimes. I would show you right now what I'm at, but I accidentally plugged it in when I was uh, trying to transfer some photos and videos, so it kind of juiced up a little bit, so it kind of reset the 24 hour cycle, But which is something I do wish that they would change. I wish they would give you the ability to see the history of your battery life instead of just showing you once. So anytime you plug it in, it kind of resets itself and says, all right, you've been using it for four hours and then this amount of screen time on. And doesn't even tell you that you've been charged up to 100%. It, I don't know. I just wish the battery settings gave you more history. Um, but besides that, the battery life is really good on this device. You don't have to worry about it, honestly. You can unplug it in the morning and you won't have to plug in either till you get to bed or maybe even in the morning. And I think that's perfect because the charging speed is fantastic on this as well. So you could put this in for 30 minutes and you're fully charged. So you could use this all night, use this all day in the morning, plug it in before you have to go to work, shower, do your thing, and then by the time you're ready, it should be fully charged. So battery life charging is phenomenal on this. The only thing you're missing is wireless charging, which for me is no problem because I prefer to use that wire charging. So I charge my phone when I need to now. I don't, I no longer decide I'm gonna charge it overnight because I, I know I have to have it charged fully in the morning. I just take my charger with me and plug it in when I have time because that's the best way to do with this device in my opinion. So battery life is phenomenal on this device. So through the day, the OnePlus 11 does have great hardware, good software, not my favorite Android skin out there, small things that I would nitpick about, but still overall pretty good. Great display, great performance, great battery life, and good cameras. You know, there's, again, we talked about the video being not the best out there, but it's also not the worst, I guess you could say. So for me, I will tell you to go get the OnePlus 11. If you were to ask me right now, yo, I'm considering the OnePlus 11, should I go and get it? Yes. If you would find it at a cheaper price as well, even better, you're winning. But I think this is, like I said at the beginning, one of the best price phones out there. Like it, the price makes sense. You're gonna lose out on some small things, but for the price, for compared to the competition, you're getting a lot of phone here, a lot of good phone. And for someone like me, I think this you know, fits my needs and handles my needs. But I would still prefer the Samsung One UI experience. That's my personal preference. But I do prefer this more than the Pixel and also more than the iPhone. So that's how I'll leave it at. Hope you guys enjoyed. Hope this helped. 